The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. The book of Hebrews, we're in the ninth chapter now. We're in the ninth chapter. And we're looking at the first ten verses. And um, I just want you to have your place. We're going to read because you can see in our first lesson, in our first point of our lesson, uh, we're going to read through there and you're going to do a little writing. Uh, <clears throat> because what the subject matter is, now remember eight, chapter 8, 9, and 10 is about New Covenant. Chapters 8, 9, and 10. In fact... The first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews is showing how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant in all the major areas, priesthood, um, all of that, oh, the how the first covenant um, you know, it was just a shadow to be fulfilled by Christ when he came. And of course, and, and so what they did is they went in, the writer of Hebrew, we're not quite sure who he was, but whoever he was did a masterful job to show you how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. I mean, and so today he's looking at, um, and it's really interesting how he's going to talk about this. And we're going to have a word of prayer, but let me show you something. I'm going to draw, here's the tabernacle um, that's, or the temple, and that's the building, okay? Inside here is what the temple or tabernacle was all about. If it wasn't for this little place here that had two rooms, the tabernacle would have been nothing. And so there was a big veil in the, to get into the first room, which was called the holy place, and there was a second veil. Here's the first veil right there. There's a second veil to get into the holies of holies. Now, what's interesting in your text, and you want to pay attention to this, they refer to these as the first tabernacle and the second tabernacle. They refer this one as the outer, and they refer to this as the inner. And it's very important that you see this, because usually if you talk about the tabernacle, you talk about the whole structure, or if you talk about the temple, you talk about the whole structure. This doesn't talk about the outer structure here, and when they talk about the outer tabernacle, they're not talking about this one out here. They're talking about this one right there, this inner sanctuary. And they're going to call it that. So I want you to be mindful of that when we go into this study today because they're going to talk about an outer tabernacle and an inner tabernacle. And they're referring to this. They're not referring to the outer at all. That part they're not even in discussion about. That's really important. And, but they are going to talk about this veil and that veil. And this is why you even have a tabernacle. And if that's removed, you don't have it. When that's removed, that whole tabernacle system is kaput. And it's going to be removed. It's going to be removed by that. Christ is going to die on that cross. He's going to be buried and raised from the dead, and that's going to be kaput. And when that becomes kaput, it's because the new covenant is in and the old covenant is out. And that's what he's going to tell you. Now, chapter is a pretty powerful chapter. But you need to have a heads up on what you're going to read. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into it.
Let me tell you one more time. This right here is the only reason that's in existence. The only reason. The only reason. And you're going to find out it's not, it's what's in these two things. It's in what is in these two things that make that important. It's not just a building and it's not just that little space that has floor space. It's what goes on in those two things. It's what's in those two things that make them spiritually important. Now we'll have prayer. I'll give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, privileged to confess sin if necessary, and that is because it is necessary. The Holy Spirit is the key teacher. He is the spirit of truth. He teaches it. He recalls it. He guides you in it. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't get it in carnality. If you're here tonight, you're in carnality either by automobile or by internet. It's going to be a futile hour. You might as well just go do whatever you want to do anyhow because you'll get nothing. Ep zero. As far as spiritual impact to your life. So, carnality, the evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and avert sins would be somewhere to go to understand that. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess that sin that you're aware of, then he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's important for you to study the Bible under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these have come our way by automobile and by internet. We pray, Father, that they would do protocol or what we call classroom etiquette. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. That means the word spirit is the Holy Spirit that's going to bring all of that both into knowledge and to the practical application of wisdom to our life. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister tonight through us, to us, and then from us. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, what we're looking at Let's, let's read our text and see point number one. We'll begin by examining the contrast between the outer tabernacle. This is the Hebrew writer. He talks about an outer tabernacle and an inner tabernacle. And notice I put them on your paper. So I want you to list some of the things because it is important for your eyes to see this because you'll never, you'll read it, not remember. But I think if you write it down, you might look back and then compare the two. It's hard to compare them as you're reading because you can see uh, for example, verse 1 and 2 is the outer ta tabernacle, and it's dealing with the first covenant. So one of the first things that I, I wrote down was the first covenant. It had regulations of divine worship, and it was an earthly sanctuary. So for me, the important thing is that this was the first covenant. It uh, regulated in, inside this system. It regulated divine worship. It was an earthly sanctuary. Notice it was called a sanctuary an earthly sanctuary. Th then in point number two, uh, there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which are the lampstand. That's the holy place. That's the holy place. That's, it's got the first veil. You got to go through and that. That's talking about that. Uh, was uh, the outer one in which there was a lampstand, a table and sacred and the sacred bread this is called the holy place. Okay? So those are some of the things you need to see. So we've, we've seen we're talking about the holy place right here. This was a, a unit. This was a unit, and it was a priesthood. The only people permitted in here were priests. Only priests could go into the first one, and only the holy priest could go into the second one, the high priest. And that was called the Holies of Holies. And the other place is called the Holy Place. And it had a veil. And then there was a second veil, you, they'll, they'll tell you. And this is, now I can't, right? This, this, this unit here called the Holy Place with a veil and then a second veil, these priests were not permitted into here. The, like Zechariah, 
John the Baptist's father, he was permitted here, but it wasn't permitted here. The only person put in there was a high priest. Because if you got in there, you could, you could get killed. You could die in there. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing in there, you better not go and steal anything out of there. Um, <laughs> that was not the place to be. Now, in verse 3, we talk about the second veil. That's over here. You know, you can go to Exodus. If you're really interested in stuff, you can go to Exodus and start with chapter 25 and read until your eyes fall out. All right? But, so he talks about the second veil. Here's the second veil right here. See that? Right there's the second veil. I'm in verse 3, and so I'm in the inner sanctuary. <clears throat> Behold, the second veil, there was a tabernacle. See, they called the tabernacle, right? Because that's what the tabernacle was all about. It's because we call these two tabernacles, we call the whole thing a tabernacle. All right? And behold, the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holies of holies. And it tells you what it has. Right? See, I've got over there verses 3, 4, and 5. And behind the second veil, okay, and having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding manna, Aaron's rod, which budded, that's interesting, isn't it? And the tables of the covenant, that's the, bo the book of Deuteronomy, was in it. That, and that was, the, that was the book for the Jew, that was the book, because Josiah, Josiah um, found it in his Reformation, and it, it became bigger than life, and etc. But anyhow, but it was the book of Deuteronomy. It was the um, classic of the law, of the Mosaic law. Uh, verse 5, and above it, above it, which is the Ark of the Covenant. See, all this is contained. The key is the Ark of the Covenant, and all these things are uh, in it or spaced around it or in it. On top of the Ark of the Covenant, this is what he's talking about, above it, which is the Ark of the Covenant in verse 3, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry, uh, verse 4, and above it were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat is the only reason for the Ark of the Covenant to be there. And because of the mercy seat, it is, and that, what was that for? The blood of Christ, right? They put the animals there with shadow Christology of Christ. That whole temple, this whole thing is all about the blood, the proper blood of Christ for the sacrifice of sin. That's what the writer is trying to get to. Yeah, the, right. It's plural. The I am on the end of that word makes that plural. You know, and if you want to go back, you can read all this stuff. You can go back and read it. All been fulfilled in the cross, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every bit it was fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ. All right. Um, now, verse 6, we go back to the outer tabernacle, which is the holy place. Agreed? All right. Thank you. And when these things had been thus prepared, the priest, the priest, are continuing entering the outer tabernacle, performing divine worship. Now, verse 7, we're back to the inner. We're back to the holies of holies. But into the second only, you see that? Into the second only, the high priest enters. Once a year, not without taking blood. You don't go in without blood. Which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Okay? Okay? Now we're back to verse 8. Verse 8 is going to cover both sides. Say, I got a 9-8 I got a nine, eight on both sides of your paper, haven't I? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is going to be the key player of information on both sides. That's true in our life too today, isn't it? Boy, you talk about, listen, the Holy Spirit was a key guy back there. He's a key guy here, isn't he? The Holy Spirit is signifying this that the way into the holy place 
Now, when they say holy place here, he's talking about the holies of holies now. You need to make a distinction there. Okay. The Holy Spirit is signifying that the way into the holy place, in other words, here, the high priest has to go through the holy place to get to the, hol the holies of holies, and that's what he's doing. So make sure you make that clear distinction. The, the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. What is the outer tabernacle? The holy place. You had to go through the holy place in to get into the holies of holies, right? right? And that's going to be it until this is no longer an issue. Now, listen to me. Now, you know this, so I'm going to stop here and tell you something that's really important. The key is that separated these two was that inner veil, the second veil. Agreed? Now, listen to me. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, 50, 51, it's on your paper. When Jesus Christ dies on the cross, that veil is going to be torn from top to bottom. And you see what's happened to access? It's over. That's why that was important to record that in Matthew. And this writer knows that. The way into the holy place had not yet been closed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol, verse 9. In verse 9, we're back to the outer, which is a symbol for the present time. Accord accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Okay? And then he's going to go on, since they relate only to food and drink and various washing regulations for the body. Now watch this. Now go back to, now, now you've got to go to the other side, to the inner, in verse 10. The last half of verse 10, the, this whole system is going on until, watch this, this is imposed until the time of Reformation. Do you see that? That goes over on the, this side, the inner side, because that's this, what he's talking about is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which is the new covenant. He's talking about the new covenant until the time of the new covenant. This system is in play until the new covenant is established. Now, the new covenant is going to be established when Christ is raised from the dead and goes back and sees the right hand of God the Father in heaven and Pentecost comes. Pentecost. Now, when Christ, when his blood is used, the system is done. But there is a transitional period from old to new. And this whole thing is not going to really be, come into light until 70 AD when the whole thing shut down. But in fact, it shut down right here when the blood of Christ does away with this. Come on now. Okay. <laughs> Probably that's getting kind of confusing up here. Let me erase this for a while. Uh, I'm getting way too much stuff on the board. I can't even tell myself. All right, we're in verse 10. Let's, 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 let's go back to that and then we'll... We'll be able to move on from that until the time of reformation. All right. Until the time of reformation. Mm -hmm. Now, see, we got the old, so we got the, now, so you got to get your head right with the writer of what he's talking, technical stuff here. He's talking about a, a outer tabernacle and inner tabernacle. That, that whole, that was the whole divine worship system, wasn't it? He just, I just read that. And that's, that's everything. And, and it, it, with Christ coming into the world in the first coming, he's got to fulfill all that. He's got to go to the cross and die. He's got to be buried. He's got to be raised from the dead. He's got to send back the Father and be seated at the right hand of God the Father before the new covenant can be issued in. See, all that's part of that program. And so there are steps to it. In it. He's got to die. He's got to be buried. He's got to be raised. He's got to go through, the session, through that. Then he's got to go back and seated. And then comes the Holy Spirit. Then comes the church age. Then comes the new covenant, yada, yada. Are you with me? 
boy, he did a whole lot in 10 verses, did he not? But what he's after is showing you shadow Christology in the nutshell. What he just showed you is the theology of the old covenant, the guts of it. Okay. Now you're probably thinking, I should have wrote some of that stuff down. But you can do it later if you haven't done it. And maybe you don't care. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. But I want to do it so you can see that what we're talking about is the difference between an old, old outer tabernacle and an inner tabernacle and how, how they, you know, how they're, how they operated then and how they don't operate now, but how the inner tabernacle, how the inner tabernacle, tabernacle had got fulfilled, which is our whole program. Well, you'll see it. William, how many times do you have to hear this stuff before you understand it? Ten times. I'm about to agree with you. I'm about to agree with you. You have to hear it several times, so I can tell you that. Because there's a lot of information that passes through here. And it sounds pretty good. And I explain it to you. You go like, oh, yeah, I got it. And then you walk away and go like, I, I, I don't get it. You go, you go, somebody says, what did you study last night? You try to tell them. And you go like, oh, gosh, I don't know. I'll get back with you. I know I used to be that guy. I used to sit where you're sitting. Uh, not in here, but you know what I mean. Uh, point number two, the writer of Hebrews has focused on a specific ministry of the holy place and the holies of holies tabernacle ministry under the first covenant and how they will be changed by the new covenant, right? What is he, what is he trying to tell us? Here was an old system that's been done away with a better new system. Is that right? I mean, that's the point. And the point is, why would you ever go back? To that old system that's kaput it's obsolete right it's ready to disappear why would you ever go back to that why would you do that and it's kind of amazing to me uh, I do understand it when when it's done in ignorance and and God God you know God acknowledges that for a while <laughs> right for a while. I mean, you can only pass I'm ignorant just a short distance because then you hear somebody say, yeah, but I told you that about 12 times. <laughs> ignorance can't be claimed anymore. It's got to go to rebellion or something else, but it ain't going to go to ignorance. And, and that's why it's important for us to share what we know to be true. It doesn't matter. Listen, sometimes a person has to d d b hear it just to come out of ignorance into the light before they ever get to the knowledge. And sometimes we, we, don't, we, we stop to forget that's how we got here. And sometimes we don't give the other people the benefit of the doubt to kind of walk them out of it, right? I mean, it's, it's tough when you walk out of darkness into light. And then to ask them to be the light, not just carry the light, is kind of difficult. So sometimes I think we ought to, I'm, I'm really, I'm a world's worst for this because Sometimes knowledge can be can work against the other person you're trying to explain it to because you give them way way too much and don't sit down and walk them out. Does that make sense to you? I call it eyes glazing. I finally get the point when I see their eyes glaze over. <laughs> and I go like, oh wait, wait. And they go like, well, I don't want to hear anymore because I didn't understand the last stuff you said. Now, I want to show you a key phrase in chapter 5. I want to show you a key phrase that you probably, you, maybe you didn't understand. I want to, I want to read again. I want, to, I want to give you the last phrase, and I want to help you understand it. And above it were the cherubims, talking about the mercy seat of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Now, listen to what he says. But of these things, we can now speak in detail. So I wrote this on your paper and I want, to, I want to help you with that. First of all, the word but is not, and that's kind of important to people like me, is not in the original text. It just begins of, and it's a, the word of is peri plus the genitive, and it should be translated concerning. Now, I don't know if your Bible did that or not. They may have just translated it but of. 
but it actually means concerning. Now, concerning these things is what he's saying. Con concerning these things, wh which is this old covenant, this old covenant uh, has these two places, the holy place and the, the holies of holies, and they're going to be, there's changes going to come. They, they were there, to, they were just temporary <laughs> until, until the Messiah came. Concerning these things, we cannot now speak in detail. What is interesting, I put this on your paper because I think it's of importance to you. Uh, the word in detail is kata plus the accusative, which is translated norms and standards according to the norm, according to some kind of norm and standard, which was the divine design for worship, right? No, look at verse one, the divine worship, divine worship, divine worship. And, and so a design for divine worship. Uh, in the norms of tangent details or, or in part, so what are, what are they, what's he, what's he talking about? He's talking about, look, these things are shadows of a substance. We only see the shadow now. We don't see this, you know, when you see a shadow, you go like, well, there's got to be, something's making that shadow. We call that the substance of the shadow. Here's the shadow. And you can only talk a little bit about the shadow, but when the substance of the shadow is revealed, we can know a great deal about it. Then we'll really be enlightened. Th this the structure, the holy place and the holies of holies in techn technical theology, they're shadows. They're just shadows of the substance that's coming, which is Christ. And when he comes, then, then it will be more fully revealed and clear to you what all of this was about. And certainly it is, is it not? I mean, look how much we know about this in the way Christ fulfilled it. Uh, and so the writer is saying that, that his immediate purpose is not sh teaching shadow Christology, but teaching the fulfillment of it in Christ and the new covenant. Do you understand? Is that, I'm not really here to teach you about the old covenant. Most of talking to Jews, you probably know all that anyhow. And if you don't, you can go back and read it. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to bring you into the light of the new covenant because the time he writes this, the, there's still, there's, the new covenant is trying to be established. We're in a transitional period and the old covenant is still being practiced by people, even, even believers, until the temple is going in 70 AD. See, this book is written somewhere in the 60s and the temple is still operational, not in the reason it was designed to be, was it? Because if you tear that, if you take away that inner program, you got nothing. And Jesus took away that inner program, did he not? <clears throat> I mean, some things we just see so clearly today that those people were really struggling with at that time. Um, by this specific phrase, the writer is saying he wants to discuss the superiority of the inner <coughs> tabernacle, <coughs> excuse me, of the inner tabernacle, which would be the holiest of holies, transition into the new covenant. Because the real, the real meat of this whole theology of this thing is in the, is in the holies of holies, where the high priest went once a year for the sin you know, with the blood for the sin. Now, what's interesting is the word mercy seat. Now, this is really important. The cherubims overshadow the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was everything and everything else around it. We had things on it and things under it. But the key to it was the mercy seat. Now, the, in the English, we call that the mercy seat. In, in Hebrew, young kipper, Kipper is that mercy seat cover. It's the word cover, a covering. Okay? Yon Kipper, the day of covering. And it was about the covering of the sin. The blood covered the sins. And so it was called the lid or the cover. But the truth of the matter, and so when it comes to the Greek language, how do we translate that? They translated what it meant. They translated the word mercy is the same is the same word that's used in the Greek, propitiation. 
Propitiation is where you get mercy. If there's no pro, pro, no pro, propitiation, if there's no propitiation, there is no mercy. <clears throat> mercy is what God gives you after propitiation. See, propitiation is the appeasement of God's wrath. Now, listen to me. You're not paying attention, but you know when you put that when you lift that cup of the new covenant in my blood, do this in remembrance of me, and we tell you to look at those nine things in the cup that, that Christ has given you in salvation, one of those things is propitiation. You know, redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, justification, all those. What I'm telling you is what you walk away from when that veil drops down and the Ark of the Covenant has been completed. The whole entire purpose of that deal is done. You know what Jesus said? Well, in a moment, I'll tell you. I mean, this is a powerful idea. This is a powerful idea. That mercy seat is propitiation. It's where propitiation took place. The cross of Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. It's where propitiation takes place. And when you come to the cross and receive propitiation, God gives you mercy. Gives you mercy. That's a powerful idea. You ought to be thankful every day. Every time you confess your sin, you ought to be thankful to God because propitiation is measured down into you by mercy, and mercy is why you're allowed to confess your sins and get back into fellowship. The mercy of God. And that mercy is extended to your life because Christ paid the ultimate price of propitiation. He took your raft to get God's appeasement or mercy. That's a powerful idea. Well, the mercy seat, it, it is in the Greek concept, and, and Romans does it really well. Now, if you have a King James Bible, you will never see the word atonement in the New Testament. Never. They don't have a word for it. They don't, that's not what they're interested in. They're going to call it propitiation. One time the King James uses the word atonement. It's in Romans, the third, uh, it, it, let's say, it could be in Romans 5.11. Look at Romans, those of you that have a King James Bible. See if they, it, I think, I don't think I wrote it down, but I think it's in 5.11. It's in the fifth chapter. Yeah, mm -mm. actually that word in the Greek language is reconciliation. There is no such word in the, no, under the new covenant, we don't, no, I mean, I, you, I just put reconciliation, I can remember. well, you can do what you want with your Bible, okay. but when you get home, you, you go to your Greek lexic, your, right. your, your okay. Greek, look it up and you'll see that word, then you connect it, because I want your, uh, you know, you, you know, you've gone through the school, so you can do this. You don't have to take Ron Adams' word. Isn't that good? Whew. God bless you. But here it is. Here's the word propitiation in, in context of what we're talking about in Romans 3, 25, 26. Here's what it says. Whom God displayed publicly. You're talking about Jesus Christ on the cross. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sin previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See the word propitiation. I mean, it's a powerful idea that we get. It was all, that's what the mercy seat was about. And that was transferred to the cross of Jesus Christ on our behalf we don't need a mercy seat. We don't have to kill more any more lambs, but God killed the one lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world forever. Once forever. What a wonderful idea this is. 
point three, the writer's focus is on the inner tabernacle called the holies of holies because of the mercy seat. He writes in, in the ninth chapter, verse three, and behind the second veil, and I wrote it out in the Greek language for you. There was a tabernacle, and I wrote the Greek word for you, which is called the holies of holies, and I wrote that out for you. Holies of holies. Now, boy, if you're talking about stand on holy ground, <laughs> theologically, you know, theologically, you, you, let me tell you something. Theologically, when you study the Bible, theologically, you're always on holy ground. What a privilege. In Matthew 27, here's our proof text. In Matthew 27, 50 through 51, Jesus cried out with a loud voice again. And with a loud voice, he cried out again. And with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. Listen to me. You know what his final words were? What? Teleestai. That, that's absolutely right. It's finished. In the perfect tense, teleestai is the perfect tense of that word. It's finished. It's completed. You know, that's, that's, that's tele, uh, tele, tele o in the perfect tense. It's finished. That was his final words. It's finished. It's completed. It means completed. It's at the end. We're done. Whoa. Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And you, uh, by the way, that's in John 1930, in case you wanted to know where he said it's finished. And you know what happened the moment he said it's finished? In Matthew 27, 50, 51, you know what happened the moment he said it's finished? The veil, the veil dropped. The veil, now that's important. The veil dropped. The veil dropped. It was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split and they were opened and we know there's a whole nother story there. If, listen, see what I wrote down. I wrote Exodus 26, 31 through 35. See that? Now don't look. That you got, this is too much study. <laughs> but that's a study on the, listen, that's a study, a detailed study on the second veil that dropped. I thought you might be interested at some time to go and take a look at that. But I do want you to look at Hebrews. I want you to look at this Hebrews. I got a passage here, 10, because we're in 9. Let's just slide over to 10. And we're going to look at verses 19 and 20. Now, I'm in the 10th chapter. We'll soon be there. I say soon. You know, it's a relative idea. Since therefore, brethren, talking to the church age, since then, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood. And, he, and when he talks about the holy place, I mean, we now know with the veil down, it's just one big place. And he's talking theologically now. And he's talking about the holies of holies. I mean, he, the, being able to enter into this whole, the whole divine system of the old covenant was in the, the, the holy place and into the, do you know what it means when that veil was dropped? It means that we are priests. He is the high priest and we're priests and we have access in the whole kabut and kabut. We ha have access in all of it. <laughs> My tongue gets all over the place. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence. You know, that, what a strong word that would be. Let me tell you how you get confidence. You come to Bible study and sit there and you learn as much as you can learn. The next time you come, you've got a frame of reference to learn more. I'm so proud of you people. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the whole place by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? By a new, watch this now, by a new and live in way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Look at that. Isn't that dynamite? That's the shadow Christology fulfilled, and that's the substance. Is that not powerful? And listen, do you not know that you live in the, in the new living way 
because of the blood of Christ and that new living way is living under the new covenant and not under the old covenant, quit going back to the old covenant and think there's anything good there for you. It's all been fulfilled in Christ. If you want something new and special and interesting to your life, go to Jesus Christ under the new covenant. Isn't that powerful? A new living way. And he, he calls the flesh of Christ on the cross becoming the propitiation for our sins. He calls it the second veil. <laughs> it's just too good. I mean, this guy was on top of it. Was he not? Whoever this writer is, he's got this Jewish stuff and is able to bring us out of that Jewish concept of the old covenant into the new covenant. Just exciting to me the way he describes this. It's just exciting to me. Uh, here's an interesting passage. Acts, the sixth chapter, verse seven on your paper. You see that? Now, look, when you enter the book of Acts, I tell you, I, I hope you will study the book of Acts having listened to me talk about that over the new covenant thing with a whole new perspective about that book. I mean, Acts 1.8, it tells you how to study the book and how God is in a transitional period. We're going to go to, we're going to start in Jerusalem. We're going to go to Judea. We're going to go to Samaria. We're going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? And when we had done, the church would be established. It's all about transition. Well, when you study this out in verse, in chapters one through six, you're in the, Jerusalem and Judea. When you get to chapter eight and nine, you're in Samaria. When you get into 10 and Yan. Uh, we get into 10 and that, then you're into, uh, you know, Gentiles, and then you got Paul, and away we go, right? So all of that's really important to do that. Now, here I am. I'm in chapter 6 of Acts, so my ministry is in Jerusalem, Judea. Agreed? Well, if you go back and read, you'll see all that. I'm just, you know, I'm giving you a cliff note version. But you go back and study, you'll know that, Right? Then, you know, we have Philip, we, you know, actually through chapter 7, you know, Stephen gets martyred and, and boy, everybody, and Paul's, Paul's on the march against the church and now you got the church moving. I mean, now you got Christians moving to other places. They're visiting cousins and uncles and aunts and they live out other places. Well, anyhow, now listen to what this says. Listen to this. And all of this is because what happened when Christ died on that cross. Now listen to me. This is, what's, this is what's happening since Christ died on the cross. The word of God kept on spreading. The number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Oh, they're out of a job, man. They've joined the Christian church. And you know what? They didn't have to sacrifice their priesthood, but they did have to sacrifice their sacrifices. Right? Every one of us is a priest. Weren't born that way. All these guys were born that way and born again into another priesthood. How about that? Right? The old one, listen, love these guys. They went, <laughs> I think I figured it this, uh, this now. I figured out why I was a priest. Isn't that wonderful? Getting saved is wonderful, isn't it? Getting saved. Point number four, what was, the, what was the big theology that took place behind the second veil that the writer is trying to make a doctrinal point about? You know what it was? Mercy seat, the blood and propitiation, right? Because that's what the mercy seat means. Here's where propitiation takes place, and you can find the mercy of God. There's your theology. And Paul picked up on it in Romans 3, as I read, and the writer of Hebrews picked up it in the ninth chapter. He pounds this through the ninth chapter. I mean, it's marvelous what he did. I mean, you know, as a guy who sits around and studies his whole life away in the Word of God, when I see a guy like this take that and do that, and I go like, Phew. and boy, was he right. I, you know, I would have said to him, man, how did, you, how did you gather all that out of that? I mean, how did you do that? And, he went, you know what he told me? He had told me what he told you. He said, the Holy Spirit signified and showed me every bit of it. Well, there's a lesson for people who want to teach the Word of God. 
not about how smart you are. It's not about how well you study. It's about how well you pay attention to the Holy Spirit in your studies. Boy, that's what I've learned. I learned it from this guy right here. Here's one. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have, a, we have an advocate with the Father. He is Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. See, there's the extension of, of confession of sin to your life. And, and not only for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Go preach the gospel of grace salvation. Tell everybody who'll stop long enough to listen. There's a young guy at Chick-fil-A that started working here a while ago. And one morning I was in there. And... I drank a cup of DK, a, a, a cup of, of just regular coffee, and my heart began to get nutty. It's never done that in the morning. Nah, nah. You know, everybody around me is dropping down with heart attacks and everything, and I go, nah. and my, I mean, it just got racing like crazy. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of went around the room in my, my mind, what's going on here? Nah, nah. Then I'm checking my left arm, my right arm. And I go, which arm am I supposed to? Wait, wait. I know where my heart is. I put my hand over it. Uh, all that stuff. So then I went, you know, I've had this before happen with me with, with coffee, you know, this, this stuff. And I thought, well, so I poured the rest of the cup I had out and went back up there and I said, hey, and I, there's this young black guy who was working there. I, and it was, I really like him. But he had just started work, and I said to him, I said, you know, I'm old enough, they call me Mr. Ron. If that helps you anyway, they call me Mr. Ron. I said to him, you know, I had a, a coffee, and my heart just got racing and everything, and oh, he said, Mr. Mr. Ron. And I said, yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's coffee. I think, it, I think I just had a kickback off from uh, the hard stuff. So give me, you got any fresh decaf? I'll get you some fresh decaf, Mr. Ron. You go back there and sit down. I said, no, I'm all right. And, then, and it, it, here's my point with that. You just never know how ministry comes around. I was, I went back to get a cup of coffee. I, I, I was, today I was in and I got my stuff and I, there's a new girl waiting on me and, and I said, I want a cup of coffee. And so she went back. There. I forgot to tell her decaf. So she went back there and got me the real stuff, you know, brought it back. He stopped her. He stopped her midstream. He says, is that decaf? He, she said, well, he didn't ask for decaf. He, That's Mr. Ron. You always give him decaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always get, I said, no, no. And so I'm listening to that. They, they think I can't hear them. You know, my hearing. I, I, there are other parts to be going, but it ain't my hearing. And that was so cute. And he said, no, you just don't leave it alone. I got it. And so he said, Mr. Ryan, you just go back. Like I hadn't heard that. Mr. Ryan, you just go on back. I, I, I'll bring it to you. And I went, okay. And I came back. And, and I said to him, I said, um, I'm so thankful for you. And he said, why is that? I said, well, you just care about your people. I mean, you just care about me. And that touches my heart in such a wonderful way. I want to do something for you today. Oh, no, Mr. Ron, no, no, no. I said, well, I'm not reaching for my hip pocket, son. <laughs> you, you, you can relax. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to tell you this. And I gave him the gospel. I shared the gospel with him. And I said, how, how does that fit with you? I said, you know, if I was to die in Chick-fil-A, that would be my, my second choice. My first one would be home with my wife. But my second choice would be right here. If I was to die, you'd be confident that I'm going to heaven, son. And then I, sh I shifted over. Could you have that confidence today? If something happened, the guys bust in here and, and there we are. Do you have that kind of confidence? And he said, mm, I don't think I have it like you have it. And, and you can see him nervous because you're not supposed to talk to customers very long. And that's a good principle. And I said, well, listen, I'll be, I'm in here every morning. We'll talk. We'll talk in little shifts, things. So, you know, it's just. And isn't that good that touch your heart that some kid like that would just care about that? And then, boy, he went back and lectured everybody. <laughs> he, he lectured everybody about Mr. Ron and 
So uh, whether I want anything, they're going to give me decaf. And shut up and just go back there. And, <laughs> go back there and drink that and stop that. But <laughs> propitiation is wonderful. And I, I extend that propitiation idea to you. Uh, I extend that to you um, and because when we do the Eucharist, part of that, that blood of Christ, part of that is the propitiation, right? And it could be even a major one, shouldn't it? I mean, we, we talk about redemption and reconciliation and all that's really important. But boy, this one, propitiation, that's what the mercy seat was about. And there was the big deal with Christ on the cross. Um, um, anyhow, the second veil was torn down because the propitiation was completed. The second veil was torn down which put the whole thing in, in, in disarray because it was completed with Christ on the cross. And, and I'm going to close with this thing that out of um, Hebrews 9, 8, and then we'll close this session. It says the Holy Spirit is signifying. Now, the, that, word, that word in the English is a big word. In the Greek, it's a little bitty word. It's de-lo-o. It's D-E-L-L. It's D-E-L-O-O. And it means to make, make, make it very plain. Now, I'm so thankful for that because sometimes I get things pretty complicated, <laughs> surely. And it's good for the Holy Spirit to just say, well, surely it doesn't, it's not that complicated. He's just showing off his theology. It actually means this. Isn't that good that he does that? The Holy Spirit signifying in this Way the in this that the way of the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed, and that's an interesting word. It means it, it's a word in the Greek. And by the way, it's in the perfect tense. It, it it's a word that means to be to be manifested uh, as revealed or disclosed. It means something to be clearly clearly manifested, clearly revealed, so you couldn't miss it. It's like the nose on your face business. That's what he's saying. And who does, you know whose job that's to do that is? Here's my point. You know whose job to do that is? The Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Everyone in this room, uh, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, or on the internet, if you believe that you died for your sins, we buried and raised from the dead third day, you have the Holy Spirit, and he's there to make things in the Word of God very clear and plainly, plain to you as he reveals the bigger program for God for your life. How good is that, my people? How good is that? And every one of us have that. We can walk away. Yeah. Uh, quick question. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, where Paul refers to our body. Yes. That's a naos. That's absolutely right. The yep. That's the inner, that's the inner sanctuary. sanctuary. It sure is. Yep. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. That's not on your paper, but it ought to be. Well, very good. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God. I hope we've excited people to open the scriptures, open their life. But listen, if you're going to study the scriptures, study them. Please study them under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is there to make things very clear to you and reveal and manifest to you the things of God in the most simple way. And by that, I mean a way that you personally can understand it. The Holy Spirit is not one over all of us, but one in every one of us. And he is able to take a person at whatever, whatever capacity they have educationally and do the same thing in their life to the person that has a doctorate and a person who had to leave school in the eighth grade to work like my grandfather. He has the power, the Holy Spirit has the power and the responsibility to make things clear and plain for our faith base. And I'm so thankful for that, Father. I'm so thankful for that. And how important is the ministry of the Holy Spirit when we study the Word of God and when we live what we've studied out in our life in practical application called wisdom. That's where wisdom is. And so we're thankful for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.